I'm going to start recording now. All right, so welcome everybody to the 2021 Northeast Michigan Great Lakes Stewardship Initiative Regional Networking Meeting. We're super excited and grateful to still be able to come together through this virtual format to share and collaborate with all of you. I wanted to start by um, introducing myself and some of the fellow facilitators today. So um, my name is Meg Schwartz. If I don't know you or haven't met you yet, um, I've met quite a few people virtually, but haven't been able to meet them in person yet. But um, I am the NEMI GLSI. So we use the acronym NEMI GLSI for Northeast Michigan Great Lakes Stewardship Initiative. Um, I'm the NEMI GLSI Network Coordinator. And with me here today is Brandon Schroeder and Megan Goss, who are both MSU Extension and Michigan Sea Grant educators. Brandon's going to be helping by sharing some content and Megan is providing technical support. Um, and she'll be monitoring the chat as well. So please reach out to her in the chat or at the number listed here with any issues. So if you wanna you know, grab your phone maybe and um, take a snapshot of that or Megan, maybe you can drop your phone number right into the chat. That would be excellent. She is providing tech support today. So we're very grateful for her. Um, and also for Brandon too, who is helping co-facilitate. Um, all right, so goals of today. The first half of our time is going to be us sharing to you um, updates from 2020, fun student project videos, upcoming opportunities for this year. We'll take a quick break in the middle and then we're gonna come back together to help foster some sharing among you, our partners and educators resources and opportunities that you have, maybe any needs that the NEMI Glissy Network might be able to um, help with. So there's gonna be lots of sharing today. Um, but first we wanted to get a snapshot of who is in the room um, and how many regional networking meetings you have attended so far, um, including today. So there's a two question poll that we're gonna put out there just to get a pulse on who's in the room. Um, and the first question, it's gonna ask you um, the best option that describes you. So you're, you can click multiple options. You might be a, an informal educator and a community partner. You might be a teacher and a donor. So feel free to click multiple options there. And then that second question is gonna be um, just a, a one kind of answer. So let's see here. Megan, if you want to deploy that poll or I can deploy it from here, I'm not seeing the poll option. Oh, there we go. Great. So everyone should be seeing the poll now on their screen. Um, and then remember with that first question, you want to click all that apply. We're up to about 50 percent. See how close we can get to that 100. It's a fun way to keep the Zoom active as well. Definitely. I did have one participant that said they had to walk their dog, so I'm not sure if they're back. I can't see everybody, but we're almost there. So if we have one hanging out that hasn't checked anything. OK, we're up to 96 percent. Should we end poll? Right. Oh, we got to 100. 100. Yay. So sharing the results now. Yay. So we have quite a mixture of folks here. Lots of informal educators and community partners, um, some donors, formal educators, administrators, and then other. I wonder what those other categories are hmm. that didn't fit into the mold. Hmm, hmm. And then Lots of new timers as well, so, or first timers. Um, so maybe about a third, 28% are first time um, participants in our networking meeting. So an extra welcome to you. Um, and then the most have attended two or three meetings. So that's pretty cool. I myself have only attended, uh, this is my second meeting and it's a little strange. Uh, the, the very first meeting since I joined in 2018 um, the very first meeting got canceled uh, last year in 2020 randomly we were able I mean not randomly but uh, we were actually able to host the, the networking meeting and then this year it's just in a little bit of a different format so 
Um, very interesting. Well, thanks for helping me get a pulse of who's in the room. Um, heading back to my slides here. I'm going to zoom out just for a second for those of you who might be newer to the network um, are just getting your feet wet with place-based education or PBE as we abbreviate it, place-based stewardship education as it's called to or PBSE. So place-based education is a pedagogy or a way of teaching and learning rather than like a program that one would adopt. Um, many subjects, not just science can be taught using place-based education. And this type of teaching and learning has been happening for decades now with research around its success. So there's different ways you can approach PBE, but what's at the core of each approach is student learning, community development, and environmental stewardship. And the NEMI Glissy Network has three different strategies to accomplish these goals. The first being hands-on learning, or we often like to call it hands in the dirt, feet in the water learning, um, where students are act interacting with their local natural resources, whether that's fish, native plants, or um, the water flowing in their local river. The second strategy is supporting our teachers. So this is accomplished in a variety of ways, but sustained prof professional learning opportunities are at the heart of our support. These opportunities include training around Great Lakes content, um, the PBE process, and more recently, uh, online tools that can help elevate place-based education projects or help adapt them to the COVID world that we're living in. And then the third strategy is helping foster um, these reciprocal school and community partnerships where each party is gaining something. So schools have needs, partners have needs, and place-based education provides a way to collaborate where the results can be um, incredibly powerful. And these three strategies we have in common with um, seven regional hubs that make up our state Great Lakes Stewardship Initiative. So we're one of seven hubs throughout the state um, kind of that employ these same three strategies. And a little bit more about how we're structured just for the, the newbies in the room. Um, our leadership team here, is, which was expanded and I'll cover that in just a second, but our leadership team is made up of stewardship and community development partners who offer perspective on current natural resource policies and happenings. Um, our education partners, which includes both administrators and educators and then our funding partners who provide uh, fiduciary services. And another leadership team member or members, of course, are our youth leaders. Student voice and choice is highly valued and is a principle of place-based stewardship education. So we definitely want them, we value their leadership as well. Some new leaders, um, let's see here. So we have some new organizational leaders that have joined our leadership team. And the first is a longtime partner in the network, um, the Friends of Neguagon State Park with Sue Keller representing there. So friends groups are often the eyes and ears of our state parks. So we appreciate the perspective that Sue brings. We also have district forester, Brittany Vanderwall from the Presque Isle County Conservation District offering perspective from the natural resource professional lens. So we're grateful to have her on board. And then curriculum specialist Amanda Weiner from the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians offers a tribal perspective and is helping us explore ways to incorporate tribal teachings into place-based stewardship education. And then there are some longtime leadership organizations that have some new faces representing them. So Abby Ertel of Huron Pines is temporarily stepping into Emily Vogelsang's role um, on the NEMI Glissy leadership team and on the administrative team um, that kind of oversees NEMI Glissy's day-to-day -day happenings. Emily uh, moved back south, we're so sad, but happy to have Abby step into her role um, temporarily and offer, you know, really appreciate her picking up the torch and offering her unique skill set um, to the team. We also have career navigator Helen Ann Cortez um, that is, has joined us from 
Alcona Community Schools, as well as AMA ESD Superintendent Scott Reynolds and COP ESD Director of Instructional Services, Rich Marshall. So we're grateful for the time that they put in to help us steer this ship um, <laughs> that we call the Nemigo Sea Network. And now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and we wanted to take a look back at 2020 to celebrate. I know that seems like an oxymoron, um, but we did have some diamonds in the coal mine. So teachers were able to adapt their projects. Um, community partners have been zooming into classrooms. Professional learning has made that conversion to virtual land. Um, and of course, these, you know, the student numbers I'm going to share and the, the project numbers I'm going to share look different than most years, um, but they're still worth celebrating. So first off, we have student numbers. Um, we engaged over 2000 students in stewardship projects. This does reflect the 2019 and 2020 school year. Um, so some of these numbers are from 2019 when, you know, pre COVID, um, but still, you know, great numbers and something to celebrate. We were able to support 72 teachers through professional development or project funding. So that switched to virtual professional development. And then we were able to do our regional networking meeting um, before things got shut down in 2020. And then we strengthened our relationships within a partner or within a network of uh, over hundred community partners. So um, this is a photo from our regional networking meeting last year seems like ages ago, but um, this was one year ago today, essentially. So um, things to celebrate, you know, even with that 2020 lens. Um, so like I mentioned, um, we quickly adapted our professional learning opportunities to the virtual world and um, even got to flex our, our skills using Google Classroom for our seven week summer institute. Um, as we saw a need arise for community partners, um, we were able to, as we saw a need for community partners to be able to connect to um, students, we offered a workshop in September um, all around uh, virtual engagement, and then um, a workshop, another workshop in November with for a popular virtual um, mapping tool, ArcGIS. So we want to be able to meet the needs of our network partners. That includes all of you. Um, and there will be a time later in the meeting for you to share your needs, including professional learning needs. So just reflecting on 2020 and um, looking ahead to 2021 here. And the next set of updates is going to be for grants that we're currently administering. Um, these grants are a slice of the funding pie that help directly fund projects, teacher, teacher professional learning, and my position. Um, and what's cool about each of these grants is that a different partner in the network has kind of picked up the torch to apply for that main grant, but has brought Nemi Glissy into the fold to be boots on the ground, helping make place-based education projects happen. So this year's NOAA Be Wet grant is held by Huron Pines and Nemi Glissy is helping co-lead the effort. We have eight teachers working on projects in three different project areas, native plant biodiversity, school forests, and public land stewardship. Um, being part of this effort provided or will provide direct funding for um, teacher projects and student projects and professional learning. And again, Abby has stepped into this new role of co-leading this grant from the Huron Pine side. We are going to be hosting a native plant workshop to support these teachers and any other teachers that want to join this spring. Um, and teachers and projects are, or teachers and students are going to be um, wrapping up their projects this spring as well. So we look forward to seeing their fun uh, products that come out of that, the student, commu student communication products that come out of that. And I just wanted to share, I'm going to share some videos later of student projects, but just some fun photos here. Um, these photos are from Agri Sims High School's project where the students harvested seeds from their rain garden and they're propagating 
um, plants in the newly renovated greenhouse. So this is them har harvesting seeds and then um, they're doing the plant propagation in their, their greenhouse, which is pretty cool. I always love sharing student photos, can't help myself. Um, another grant we have in the hopper is uh, we're in year one of the NOAA Marine Debris Prevention Grant that is held by another partner, um, the Community Foundation for Northeast Michigan. And we've been working with two teachers to put together a kit that's focused on reducing lunchroom waste that will empower students to take action in preventing this kind of waste by conducting analysis and making recommendations to the decision makers of their school. It's been really fun to see their communication to their food service directors. Um, and I'm excited to roll this kit out to a new set of teachers this coming school year. So this is a two year opportunity and um, year one, we've been working with two teachers and next year we'll have, we'll be onboarding another 10 teachers. So really this summer we'll be onboarding um, another set of teachers. And then just some additional funding that we secured in 2020 um, from some local grants from the Community Foundation. And then we, we just got word in December that we secured another Youth Advisory Council grant to roll out the Great Stewards Challenge, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the Center for Great Lakes Literacy has also been a longtime funder of the Summer Institute teacher stipends, um, but has also begun to provide funds to cover the planning, marketing, and conducting of the actual institute as well. So we're grateful for their funding. And the final slice of the funding pie is our donors. So we're new to fundraising. Um, this is our second year of fundraising or 2020 was our second year of fundraising because we were previously funded by the Great Lakes Fishery Trust that laid the foundation of funding and really got this network started. So in the first year of us uh, fundraising in 2019, we were able to raise almost $7,000. And then this past year in 2020, we raised over $20,000, which is amazing. Um, that does include a $5,000 gift from the MySTEM network to support place-based education in the region. And then from, of the gifts from 2020, so taking a little slice of that, um, $8,330 were from new donors. So the, the Great Lakes Fishery Trust, um, they offered us last year at the beginning of the year, they offered us a $20,000 challenge grant at the beginning of 2020 to raise $20,000 from new donors by the end of the year, kind of helping us build a foundation of, um, a, you know, lay the, the framework for um, some returning donors, that kind of thing. So they were gracious enough to extend our deadline to the end of 2021. So that gives us extra time to help fulfill the challenge. So essentially what that means is that we have till the end of the year to raise about $12,000 and that's gonna trigger them to um, grant us $20,000, which is awesome. So what my ask of you would be, uh, my little pitch here would be, please help us spread the word about the Nemuglesi Network and the amazing things that you guys are all doing. Um, forward a newsletter to somebody who cares about the Great Lakes and natural resources. I'm going to share some student videos later in the meeting. Please feel free to share them far and wide. If you haven't liked us on social media yet, go do it. Uh, we share lots of fun updates there. And um, with that, I am going to hand the mic over to Brandon to give us a recap of the visioning that we did last year during our um, regional networking meeting last year. So Brandon, if you want to take it away, pull these slides up here. Yeah, thanks, Meg. And, and I think uh, last year, or the year before actually, where, where we were snowed out, uh, but last year really as a network, we were trying to think of um, how do we move forward together? So the real value in the network is that we all are recognizing whether we're on the community partners side or the school side, that we can do more together and across Northeast Michigan. And we've had the amazing support of the Great Lakes Fishery Trust investing a significant amount of dollars over a 10 year period in Northeast Michigan. And by design, uh, we were uh, in, you know, transit, we are in transition, fledging, if you will, uh, from that Great Lakes Fishery Trust funding and seeking ways to 
uh, stand on our own two legs. And some of that is still continuing to find opportunities through our partner network to bring outside resources into Northeast Michigan. But part of that fundraising effort that Meg just described is us saying, gosh, how do we um, invest in ourselves? And um, so the, bo I mean, the bottom line for, for me um, is that is part of a broader visioning effort that we tried to do as a network. This is your network. All of us on this call, this is a network we all built uh, together. And this annual meeting is really the one time we all uh, can get together. Not everybody's here, you know, people come and go, uh, but this is the one time a year we set aside to get together to celebrate the awesome things we've done together, uh, to network together, to lean on and learn from each other, to share uh, and just be excited about what we're doing as a, a collective uh, partnership. But um, by design, this meeting is also um, really an advisory, right? So there's a leadership team that Meg described that meets uh, three times a year, four times a year to really help uh, guide the day-to-day -day activities of the, the network ship. But because this network belongs to everybody, this advisory group, this one time we set aside for everybody to come together is really our opportunity to ask you all uh, what you envision or what you wanna see out of the network. So your voice, um, guides this network. It has guided this network. If you remember, if you've been to more than one networking meeting, you know that we always have an opportunity. We always have some facilitated discussion where we're asking you to weigh in on something or to share your input on, on something. And so uh, we spent a lot of time last year uh, asking you what your values in the network were, uh, what your vision and what the direction you'd like to see in this network uh, for the next uh, 10, 10 years uh, might look like. So uh, what are we doing well and what would it look like if we could do it even better? So that first question, values in our, our, our network and partnership, uh, really boiled down to um, all of your conversation, three things. One, the value in partnerships, uh, you know, the opportunity to network and, and having these robust relationships among ourselves. Uh, two, the community and environmental benefits that result from the work that our youth leaders and our school partners are helping to facilitate and the school improvement goals that are accomplished through positive youth development opportunities in this place-based education strategy. So um, to me, that's exciting because that really reflects the three core pillars of uh, the work that the, net, the three core strategies that we've invested in over many, many years. So to me, that helps to say our, your values in the network reflect the work that we've been striving, striving to do together. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, what are the critical functions of the, uh, the network? Um, so what are the criti cr critical things that this network does that we all individually are able to accomplish as an organization uh, alone? Uh, so one is the network uh, leadership and capacity building. Uh, that might look like funding, but it might look like a, a, a joint professional learning opportunity or a collective group of partners coming around a school. Uh, facilitating network conversations and coordinate, coordination. So a function like a meeting like this, having being able to bring multiple schools together or multiple schools and community partners together. Um, high quality uh, PBSE practices and pedagogy. So really um, seeking opportunities through professional learning support, sustained support for educators, but also the direct work with students really trying to strive to not just talk about, but to apply and, and, and put um, high quality place-based ed practices into practice, and then connecting schools with community and, and conservation goals. And I think that speaks, um, you know, to the purpose we're giving students in their learning, right? So the students are out doing projects that are meaningful and important to their community and, 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 and outlined as a part of conservation goals. So the last slide is what would that 10-year vision uh, for our network look like? Uh, so some of these, uh, speak to education, our, our school partners. Can, could place-based education be the new normal of what education looks like in Northeast Michigan schools? Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about schools, but um, do we have communities that readily embrace place-based education and are always asking the question, how, where do we insert youth uh, in our community, uh, community work or our conservation strategies? Uh, is there always a, a place, a voice, an opportunity for youth to be engaged to our communities um, uh, embrace that, that, that youth involvement. Networking, uh, not just regionally 
but beyond. So continuing the opportunities to network like this, but also seeking opportunities to spread the word and really showcase the great work Northeast Michigan you all are doing uh, among our state and, and national networks. Uh, and also bring those national, state national network expertise back into our region to learn from, from those beyond. So share and learn. Uh, and then from a leadership team standpoint, really formalizing our leadership structures. We've, this is a very Northeast Michigan thing. What I love about living in Northeast Michigan is we, we do a lot together because we have these robust relationships and we, we have a lot of trust in each other. Uh, but putting some of that on paper and really formalizing some of the processes and the structures by which our leadership team works and, and just uh, really having a, a, a not, not just having a thought out process, but, but, but committing to it on paper. And then stable and sustained funding. And that really goes back to uh, what Meg, I'll end on that because that goes back to what Meg shared is really just saying, how do we make sure that we have a diverse funding portfolio so that we can keep doing this awesome work together? So with that, um, you know, just wanted to share that summary. Uh, I think it's important. You guys put a lot of time last year to put that ideas on paper and to have this conversation. Uh, I think it's important that you know that you were heard. Um, we took a lot of time over the year to reflect on that and to summarize that into some, some visioning uh, documents that are gonna continue to guide the work we do. So thank you for all of your investment in, in what I just shared. Yay, thanks, Brandon. Um, yeah, we certainly are grateful for the, the time and effort you guys put into that last year. Um, wanted to share back out. So we, uh, I mean, I know you guys are on the Nemi Glissy website every day, but uh, you may have noticed that our website switched over to our new website. And Megan, I think you dropped it in the link or the link in the chat. Um, but I would invite you to go check out the new Nemi Glissy website. Um, I'm going to see if I can share it here really quick. Um, let's see. Oh, so I should be able to share my full window here. So this is my view. I'm already logged in here, but you'll see some changes. Um, there's some scrolling at the top. There's buckets on the bottom for different projects, partners and organizations, resources. You'll know they. You'll notice there's a donate button here now, which links to um, a place where you can donate. And what I, how I would invite you to use the website is um, by logging into your account. So by going, going to participate and then down to your account. And if you had a login on the, the previous account, our, our other NAMI Glossy website, it will be the same login. Um, but if you need to request a new password, no worries, just go ahead and do that. Maybe just send me a message or something. And I think we can figure out that on our end. But you can also set up a new account. Um, and so there's some really cool functionality that goes into this. I'm just going to log in here to show you guys really quick. Um, but you're able, as partners, when you have a, a login, you're able to send a message to everybody that also has a login. So um, it can essentially be used as a list serve, basically, if you have an event that's coming up that you want to get the news out about, if you are looking to, um, maybe you have a question about something and you need some resources on it, you can just go through and, you know, check everybody's name or if you want to just message a specific person's name that maybe you don't have their email address, there's some really cool capabilities here. Um, additionally, uh, when you have your login, you will be able to add an event for others to attend. You'll be able to add an organization. Maybe your organization isn't represented on here already, or you can add a news article as well. So if you have an article that you've published, or maybe you have a really fun student project that made it onto the WBKB, um, you would be welcome to add that here as well. So go play around in there. It's not perfect yet. Um, I'm learning in 2020 and 2021 that things don't have to be perfect before you launch them. So we pulled the trigger on it. It's not super ready to go. So if you see some gaps and some resources missing, uh, bear with us. We are working on it day by day to get it um, ready to go. And I'm gonna go back. 
to my presentation. Okay. Um, all right, switching gears. So upcoming opportunities provided through the network. We have a few different place-based education opportunities coming up. Um, we have the second year of that NOAA Marine Debris Prevention Grant rolling out. And we're looking for 10 teachers to use this new kit, this taking a bite out of lunch lunchroom waste kit with their students. Um, there's gonna be project and professional learning support provided for that. So if you're a classroom teacher and you're interested, let me know. We will be recruiting for that later this spring. Um, we're also rolling out an H2OQ program. This is in partnership with the Central Michigan University and Mich the Michigan Geographic Alliance. Um, it's focused on water quality, specific, specifically chemistry um, in the water, and uses a really cool map to enter data and see data from all over the state. Um, so we will also be looking for 10 teachers, probably middle school and up, that would be interested in looking at water chemistry in their local watershed. It's got a, a really cool kit that comes in a backpack with tools that you can use out in the field to analyze water quality. So, and then finally, um, coming to fruition pretty quickly here is the Great Stewards Challenge, which will be made possible through another that other Youth Advisory Council grant. Um, student field visits have, um, been really limited due to COVID, but there has been an in increase in people spending time outdoors. So this project seeks to give youth and their families ways they can visit and explore and provide stewardship for public lands in the region, um, like reporting invasive species or removing litter. Um, and we want to frame this challenge in a way that promotes outdoor time as a way to improve mental health too, which we all know is true. Um, and the grant's going to allow us to create a map of public lands for Alcona, Alpena, Montmorency, and Presque Isle counties. And we're hoping to expand this to all of Northeast Michigan. So basically people are going to be able to find a local outdoor space on this map, um, maybe somewhere they haven't been before. They'll be able to choose an activity or activities or how they want to explore and care for the land. And then the challenge um, is designed to be COVID friendly, um, but, this is also an easy way for an Glissy to engage with folks that might not have students, um, where they're students in classes where there's uh, place-based education happening. So it's just another outlet for stewardship in our region. So there's lots of locations throughout the region that need our stewardship. So we're looking forward to rolling this out. Of course, we have to announce um, our student film competition theme for next year. So all, for all you filmmakers out there, the 2022 student film competition theme is Science in the Sanctuary. And this theme is going to be evergreen going forward. So um, that's gonna be the theme from here on out, but it can be interpreted in lots of different ways. We are going to be archiving the this year's um, hashtag freshwater is winners on the new Namiglesi website pretty soon. So look for those and I might just send out a little message so you guys can go check those out too. And then this is what we have in the hopper for professional learning this year so far anyway, I'm sure there'll be more. Um, a native plant workshop happening this spring. We're also piloting uh, these open spaces called circles of support for teachers. Um, a time for teachers to cross share project ideas, wins, hurdles that they've had to overcome. Um, but, and we have considered having these circles be formed around a, like a cohort of folks after a professional learning opportunity. So there's gonna be a group of teachers going through the native plant training. Um, would they like to meet semi-regularly to share ideas about their projects? We're experimenting a little bit about with what this might look like, but um, wanna open you know, offer an open space for teachers to cross share, share similar to what we're gonna be doing later in our um, meeting today when you guys have time to cross share. And finally, uh, so Summer Institute 2021, 20, um, if you ever want tips on Bitmojis, by the way, you've seen probably this little Bitmoji that I've had um, and it's different animation forms throughout my presentation. If you want tips on Bitmoji, message me after. There's a Google Chrome add-on where you can add fun Bitmojis um, into your presentation. But anyway, uh, Summer Institute 2021 still being planned, but its theme will be around water and water quality. 
If you're new to place-based education, Summer Institute is where you should get started. Um, it's a workshop that basically explains place-based education pedagogy and then gives you time and money to plan your projects. And then there's different content trainings. You know, we have different themes every year for different content trainings as well. So this is definitely where you should get your feet wet. No puns, of course, but um, yes, uh, start with Summer Institute if you are new. All right, um, so this next part, I think is gonna be my favorite part. We're gonna share three videos of student projects that have been happening this year. So despite everything, things move forward with place-based education. Their focuses are all different from fish to biodiversity to threatened plants. And each video is about four minutes long. We'll be asking some trivia in between. So I'm gonna stop sharing this little section and... And Meg, while you are switching yeah. over to the video, there is a question in the chat from Jenny Poley. Yes. Uh, will the 2021 Institute be virtual again? Oh, that that's TBD, Jenny, but probably either a blend of virtual um, or maybe in person if we can do outdoor stuff by then. So we're not sure. We're still in planning mode, so. Members of the Senate, first of all, thank you for your close attention. All right, let's see here. So I'm gonna switch to the videos. Bear with me here as I get my screen switched over. As students in the Science in the Bay PBL class, we work in groups to solve real life situations and get first person experience. Recently, we were presented with this project called Panic at the Cisco. It was structured around the fact that we had to learn about genetics and natural selection. We were introduced to what was referred to as the Corrigan problem. Fisheries biologists have noticed uh, that the morphology, the, um, the trait variation has increased in the Cisco's of the Great Lakes over time. Uh, making taxonomy very difficult. Researchers began to struggle to set the different fish apart. So we researched and looked into three of the five variations of the Cisco species, and each group focused on a single feature in fish. From there, we gathered information and formed claims as to why these changes occurred. So the way we did this project was pretty unique due to remote learning, and it was definitely challenging because we couldn't be in class and we had to do it on our own time. So. The way we did it is we downloaded an app called Pixel Zoomer on the Chromebook, which this is where we could take a screenshot of the fish and measure from one end to the next, which then we could plug into a spreadsheet. And our goal was trying to help the scientists what caused variation, like human impact, climate change, pollution, anything. We were remote for the entirety of this uh, project, so students would come to class and they would break out and do some measuring and then take a look at some of the ratios and come up with problems or maybe reasons why these characteristics or these ratios would be different. As individuals, we were assigned a Cisco trait and constructed a CER as an end result of our project. We used our knowledge to make a claim, supported it with our data from our spreadsheets for evidence, and elaborated with reasoning. We learned how to take our knowledge and apply it in a professional CER format. From there, we also set up future years of our class with our data in our CERs. Throughout our Panic at the Cisco project, we've had a lot of help from our community partners. This project would not have been possible without them. Fishery biologists Chris Olds and Brandon Schroeder, Schroeder have aided us throughout the whole process. They helped us an analyze the data from the fish and understand, understand what the data we gathered meant. They also answered any questions we had about anything to do with the project and cleared up many misconceptions. They were a big part of the project and were a lot of help throughout the whole process. I have had the opportunity to work with the Alpena High School uh, Science in the Bay initiative um, to provide uh, some Alpena High School uh, genetics classes with a science project that's you know uh, hands-on and a real-world um, 
problem that we're facing right here on the Great Lakes right now. We've been collecting these fish for about a decade now and taking digital images and measuring uh, their structures. So things like their dorsal height, their body depth, their head length, and coming up with ratios that we can compare each species uh, across the Great Lakes and then also within a species uh, of the same form. And what's really been exciting is to be able to take that data and those images and share them with the students and let them do the exact same thing. Take image, or take these images, take measurements, and then compare them across the species and, uh, and look for differences. And ask, using the scientific method, ask questions about you know, why they're different and how, you know, how this is, has been occurring. And so to see th their wheels turn and think critically about these questions that we're facing every day as scientists um, has been just fantastic. What was really fun for us was some of our students thought outside the box and asked questions that even our scientists didn't quite know the answer to, which made them think maybe they need to look at some of those factors and, and why uh, the characteristics of the fish are different. Although we had to work on a majority of it from home, with Google Meets and mentor guidance, we are able to learn and participate in this amazing experience and be part of real life experiments that will hopefully continue to expand in future classes. So we were, we were going to do a little trivia in between um, each project video uh, just for fun, but we are running a little behind. So we're gonna skip the trivia and just go right into the next video. So we've got two more videos to go. Um, hope you guys are enjoying these. Our fourth grade students are participating in a biodiversity project. This project is gonna be a long-term study. We have 43 acres of school forest. And on our many hikes out there, the kids have been very curious about what type of wildlife we have that's present. We are doing our research in 43 acres of trails near wetlands, fields, and forests. He was involved with it in fourth grade and some of the teachers and all three of the fourth grade classes are doing it too. So this year, during our hikes, we went out and we looked for evidence of animal sign and we used that evidence in order to figure out where to put our cameras. Each of our three fourth grade classes has two cameras that they put out at their chosen locations and they have been tracking what types of animals show up on those cameras. Which has been really neat because we've found bobcats, coyote, fox, deer, feral cats, rabbits, we even had a flying squirrel once. So it's pretty, been pretty exciting for the kids to see what's there when they're not out there and to also learn a little bit about each of those different species. What we've done so far for our biodiversity project is number one, we found some locations of where the animals were at and number two, we put cameras up and took pictures of the animals and number three, we put them on paper and recorded our data that we've learned from the animals. Studying biodiversity is important because to know what animals we have around our property and how the ecosystem is go doing. We've had our cameras out for about three months now and we're about ready to wrap up that phase of collecting data and start to analyze and look at what types of animals, where are those animals moving and hopefully be able for the students to share this information as we make decisions about our property, where trails will go, where potential buildings will go. So when spring comes, we're going to be doing a little bit of mapping. We're gonna be taking our iPads out and doing some GIS work so the students can collect where do we have forests, where do we have wetlands, where are our trails, and where have we seen the most animal activity so they can kind of get a feel of how animals connect to their environment and how what impact we have on that. So they really enjoyed taking ownership of that property and what's out there and protecting it and becoming stewards of the land. I'm excited about this project because this is something we can do every year and we can kind of look at year's data and kind of see over time 
what impact we've had on the land. Um, we can start to make choices about what we're going to do with the land. The kids get to make choices about what we're going to do with the land. It really kind of gives them that ownership and that voice in a piece of land. One of my favorite parts about working on this project is that we know more about the way the ecosystem works. I liked about this project the most is that we that we have to record our data uh, because we we learn so much about other animals and how they what they've done on camera to see to record our data that we've learned from all the animals and I think that's really cool. The purpose of our project is to identify the dwarf-like iris in different times of the year and map its areas of growth. Our project is taking place in Thompson Harbor State Park in Presqu'ile. The park is on the shore of Lake Huron between Alpena and Roger City. We are working in a coastal fen and the forested area along a hiking trail. The dwarf-like iris is the Michigan State wildflower and is a threatened species. In Michigan, it only grows along the northern shores of Lake Huron and Lake Michigan, so its range is small and therefore needs to be protected. Thompson's Harbor State Park and the surrounding Presqu'ile area is home to one of the largest populations of dwarf lake iris in the state of Michigan. The park itself is about 5,100 acres and it has seven, little over seven miles of Lake Huron shoreline. There are a variety of different ecosystems within the park. There are sand dunes, there is a coastal fen, and there's a variety of uh, different forested areas along with hiking trails that are in the park. We want to educate the students um, as to what a unique ecosystem we have here and why we need to protect it. So we're trying to foster good stewardship of the land and for these students to go back and talk about what we're doing to the community, to their parents, to their siblings, and to their friends. Before our site visit, in class we studied the characteristics of Thompson's Harbor State Park and we researched the dwarf lake iris. So the students did independent research in the classroom and then we followed that up with a site visit to the park where they explore different areas of the park. They learned how to identify different native and invasive plant species. They learned how to identify the dwarf lake iris in its dormant form, so when it's not blooming. And then they also used quadrats and handheld GPS units to figure out where the iris is actually growing. We also learned how to identify the native species growing in the coastal fen. We were also able to see carnivorous plants like the pitcher plant. Uh, we are working on this project with, of course, the Northeast Michigan Great Lakes Stewardship Initiative, Blake Gingrich from the Michigan DNR. Brittany Vanderwall is our Presqu'ile County District Forester. She is involved with the project and also with Huron Pines. So the project is being funded through a Be Wet grant. Uh, most of my students had driven past the park, frequently driven past the park, but had actually never driven in and visited it. And it's really only about 10 miles away from our school. So already with just one site visit, they're really excited about being in the park and all that it really does have to offer now that they've explored it a little bit. This spring, we'll be visiting the park to see the flowers when they're in bloom and to map where they are growing. We will also be creating something for the public, hopefully a sign that can be put in the park to teach people about the dwarf lake iris. So people who visit the park know it is protected and is illegal to move. And we also um, would like to start a Facebook page just for you know our, our current project, but also for future pro stewardship projects that we you know undertake at Posen, so we can get the word out about what we're doing and, and really pass that word on to the public, and so they can learn a little bit about it and to also you know go visit the park and be able to see it for themselves. Our project is important because it helps us learn about new careers we could pursue. It also helps us learn about how we can be good stewards of our local natural areas. My favorite part about our site visit was being in the coastal fen and playing in the mud. My favorite part was using the GPS and the quadrats. Oh yay, so fun. Thanks for 
uh, being patient with us and watching all those. I think that, I mean, that's my favorite part of what we do, right, is the actual projects and getting to see the students work and their their perspective, really. So, um, so now we are going to head into that cool document that I shared with you um, as part of our pre-work to do some networking in these Google slides. So basically, uh, what this is going to be is a, um, an elaborate um, Google, uh, sorry, an elaborate business card uh, essentially that you're going to fill out. And um, Megan, if you can drop that link into the chat if you haven't already. Oh, you sure did. Um, if you can go ahead and fill out, if everyone wants to go and find the slide that has your name on it already. And you want to, sorry, make click yeah, on the ahead. second link I shared. I shared two links at the same time, oh, so sure. my apologies about that. Second link. Perfect. Yes. So, uh, yeah, um, if you want to go in there, find the slide with your name on it already, please don't edit other people's slides. Um, and fill out your contact information. You're, there's going to be a spot for you to fill out any resources or upcoming opportunities that you'd like to share that are relevant for the network. And then this is a place where you can list any needs that the network might be able to help you with as well. So this could be funding, professional learning, any tools, um, things like that. So why don't we spend the next four minutes doing that and um, then just you know, if you want to turn your video off and stretch for a little bit, uh, this is kind of our combined break time where we're filling stuff out, but we are running a little behind. So um, if you want to spend some time filling that out and we'll have time to um, expand on these resources and needs and stuff like that in our breakout rooms as well. So I'm going to be quiet so you guys can can work. And if you are able to embed links for any opportunities or resources in that document, that would be great too, just so we can, you know, we have the links to sign up or find the actual resource. <laughs> 